Welcome back. This is the next lecture for Chapter 19 about revolutions in politics. Last time we talked about Napoleon's reforms while he was the leader of France. Now we're going to talk about Napoleon's empire outside of France. So, in 1805, Napoleon, after a few years of peace, decided to basically, you know, turn the war machine back on. So, at that moment, they controlled all of France and basically most of Italy and the Netherlands were puppet states of the French. So, they were already on a total war footing. They had the biggest army in possibly European history, a few hundred thousand men who were well-trained, experienced, were using really innovative tactics, which had, you know, broken through um, new, numerous occasions. In particular, Napoleon was known for being really good at using artillery, like small cannons that were very easy to move around battlefields. But in 1805 and 6, there's two big battles to be aware of, Austerlitz and Jena. These are the battles where Austria and Prussia are defeated and brought under French hegemony. So they're not ruled directly, but they're basically now in a position where they are really sort of, you know, vassal states of the French. So the Austrian and French monarchs are allowed to stay in power, but they have to accept the Napoleonic law code. And for the first time, the people of these countries are given, you know, equal rights before the law and all of the good things that the civil law code is giving them. So this is something that actually kind of endeared a lot of people from the middle and lower classes across Europe to Napoleon and kind of turned them against the monarchies of their own countries. The fact that French conquest came with a guarantee of some rights. So in 1806, though, Napoleon officially abolishes the Holy Roman Empire. So at that moment, the Holy Roman Empire, which had existed for a thousand years, going back to Charlemagne, is gone. And the title of Holy Roman Emperor no longer exists. And all of the small states and kingdoms and counties and duchies and so on that had made up the Holy Roman Empire, like the hundreds of them, they're reorganized into a couple of dozen big states that become known as the Confederation of the Rhine and it will have the Napoleonic Law Code, and it'll basically, once again, be kind of like a puppet or a satellite of France. Now, France, then, Napoleon begins to organize Europe into the continental system. Now, we'll look at this more in a moment. So by 1810, then, he pushes even farther. Most of Spain is under French control. Um, the Confederation of the Rhine is under French control. Most of Italy is under direct French control. And you can see, according to this map, countries that are allied with Napoleon and under French hegemony. So Prussia and Austria, Denmark, Norway. The Russian Empire also submits to French hegemony. So once again, the Tsar stays in power, but Russia is now really sort of under the direction of France. Great Britain, though, stays independent. Now, the Holy Roman Empire, once again, is no longer, it is reorganized into the Confederation of the Rhine. And there's a parliament, and they're really sort of under the, you know, influence of the French government. So, after these battles then, Napoleon commissions the Arc de Triomphe, the great triumphal arch in the center of Paris, to celebrate these smashing victories. And it contains statues of him, his generals, you know, names of generals and soldiers who died in battle. And this is one of the great centerpieces of neoclassical style, and of the whole sort of imperial project that Napoleon is creating. Now, once Napoleon has established this hegemony over much of Europe, in places that didn't have a monarchy before, or places where a monarch was removed from power forcefully because they put up too much resistance, Napoleon's going to install his brothers and sisters, his relatives, in these kingdoms. And you see that the Bonapartes then become this imperial family, where all of these other Bonapartes will essentially be puppet rulers, you know, um, for Napoleon. And he's trying to create the system where his family become like the royal dynasty that dominates all of Europe. And he divorces his first wife, Josephine, and he upgrades his wife. He marries an Austrian Habsburg princess named Marie Louise, because if he's trying to create a royal dynasty for himself, he needs royal blood in his children. So Marie Louise has a son with him, Napoleon II. So the continental system then, Napoleon then basically tried to do economic warfare against, against Britain. Eventually he wanted to try and invade Britain, but 
this was really going to be impossible for a couple of reasons. Number one, Britain had the biggest navy in the world, the most technologically advanced navy in the world. And um, it was really going to be impossible for France to try and invade Britain unless they could really sort of do something about that Royal Navy power. So, one decisive battle, though. In 1805, off the coast of Spain, the Battle of Trafalgar, Britain demolishes a joint French and Spanish fleet. And basically, this, this is such a setback to the French Navy that it really becomes a total impossibility that the French would ever be able to directly invade and conquer Britain. So Britain then will always be this kind of thorn in Napoleon's side for the entire time that he's in power after that. Now, France then, under the continental system, will be the centerpiece of what Napoleon thought was going to be kind of like a self-contained, self-sufficient trading system. And he wanted to create a system where everyone in Europe would be trading with each other, but not Britain. So he wanted to destroy Britain's trade with the continent. But what he didn't realize, though, is that France and the continent and Great Britain, their situations were not the same. So the Royal Navy immediately blockaded the continent after Napoleon declared the system to be in place. So that meant no goods coming in from overseas to the continent, well, a slow trickle coming in, nothing from Britain coming into the continent, and all of the goods and resources that European countries had sold to Britain or sold overseas to their colonies, that was now going to be cut off. So basically what happens here is that Britain, they have like a full run of the seas. They can go and trade with the Americas, they can trade with Asia. So they don't really lose too much when Napoleon tries to cut Britain off from the continent. And instead, when they're cut off from Britain and when the continent is cut off from the world, this is a huge detriment. And this is really the thing that starts to undermine Napoleon's power very quickly. Because Russia, for example, they exported huge amounts of timber to England. And um, Spain relied on its trade with its colonies for all of its economic strength. And France is no longer going to be able to take in you know, resources from overseas. So very quickly, you start to see these countries that were under Napoleon's thumb really kind of, you know, losing faith in his leadership very quickly. And France, Napoleon had tried to keep taxes low in France, tried to basically keep France's economic strength high, and in order to do so, he relied more and more on overtaxing the areas that he had conquered. So that built up a lot of resentment to Napoleon, even while they still appreciated the sort of, like, legal rights and the law code that he had brought to them. So... Now, this leads to some backlash and nationalistic responses to Napoleon. So in Haiti, Napoleon actually tried to reimpose and reinstate slavery in Haiti in 1804, which obviously people in Haiti were not too fond of. They won their independence in 1804. Britain will really kind of crystallize their anti-French nationalism here and will always be sort of looking for any place they can to undermine Napoleon's strength. So they send troops everywhere they can to support soldiers fighting against the French. And one of those places in Spain and Portugal, where guerrillas, or little warriors, are going to begin fighting against France. So in in Spain and Portugal, you see this kind of insurgence against the French that starts small, And, you know, it's not just troops in uniform, but just people in the countryside will start rising up against French control and pushing back against them. And this guerrilla, or guerrilla warfare, really kind of bogs down the French, and they're never able to really complete the conquest of Spain and Portugal. And then elsewhere, you start to see monarchs really taking seriously the idea that they need to commit to total war themselves. So the Prussians, the Austrians, the Russians... They've never really been on board with the idea of bringing too many peasants into their army or making their armies too big because they were worried about those armies then becoming a counterweight to their own power. If you're the king of Prussia, you don't want too many people in your army to the point where they think they have power over you and where they can ask for rights and liberties and so on. But now, 
these countries have no choice if they want to become independent. So even in Prussia and Austria, the monarchs there make promises that they will give rights and equality and so on in exchange for more and more people being willing to join the army and fight against Napoleonic control in order to regain their independence. So, the downfall begins. So in Spain and Portugal, the guerrilla war turns into something bigger. The British send in troops, and this becomes known as the Peninsular War. So, the general who led this effort for the British is named Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington. He becomes known as the Iron Duke. He's kind of like the number one pain in the butt for Napoleon for the next several years. And he shows up pretty much everywhere that Napoleon <laughs> is having trouble. But the British support the Spanish and the Portuguese and drive the French back into France. And this forces Napoleon to divide his forces. And it really is kind of the first exposure where French power is clearly limited, where Napoleon doesn't have the sort of invincibility that he, you know, might have thought he had and that others, you know, thought he had. So in 1812 then, the Tsar of Russia decides to break the continental system and start, you know, exporting timber again. And he just felt like, I have no choice for my people, you know, and for my country to be prosperous. I have to break the system that Napoleon was trying to create. And the Tsar, Alexander I, he had actually been a friend of Napoleon. He had been sort of, adm uh, he had kind of admired Napoleon, and now he felt he had to turn on him. So Napoleon sends in an army of 600,000 men, uh, you know, pulled from all over the empire. You know, Frenchmen, Italians, Dutch people, Germans. So they sent in this army, and the Russians engage in what's known as a scorched earth policy where rather than fighting the French in open battle, they keep retreating and retreating and burning farmland, destroying livestock, making it impossible for Napoleon's army to actually feed themselves off of the land and forcing them to stretch their supply lines longer and longer. So by the time that the French army is deep in, in Russia, near Moscow, then you start to see this insurgency where Russian troops and the Russian people rise up and start sort of like cutting off the supply lines and then winter sets in and Napoleon's army freezes to death, starves to death and by the middle of 1813 he has no choice but to retreat back to France but by that point most of the army is gone 600,000 men went in 30,000 men came out of France it was an absolute disaster and most of those men were very experienced soldiers, so that is an enormous catastrophe. So then finally, in 1814, there's a final battle at a town called Leipzig in Germany. So here, a coalition of nations, including the British, the Prussians, the Austrians, they defeat France. And the French army really was not able to recover from the disaster in Russia to the point where they could effectively, you know, defend themselves against this coalition. So this is going to be the first great you know, final defeat of Napoleon's career. He abdicates, he gives up his throne, and he is sent to the island of Elba off the coast of Italy, basically to be imprisoned there. Um, now, then, the Bourbon dynasty is restored to France. Louis XVIII, who had fled the country, you know, the next in line of the Bourbon dynasty, he comes back to France and becomes the king. But, he's not stupid. He realizes that he needs to guarantee, you know, the, the changes that had occurred during the revolution if he actually wants to stay in power. So he very quickly agrees to a constitution and becomes a sort of liberal constitutional monarch, but it is a sort of move back towards something, you know, more traditional in French society. So 1804, Napoleon riding high as the emperor, 1814, not so happy. So the island of Elba it was right off the coast of Italy. It was inhabited mostly just by peasants. And Napoleon, the British kind of like make fun of him here by calling him the Emperor of Elba. So while he's on Elba, you know, he's constantly like looking for a way to escape. And finally he does in 1815 when the other countries in Europe, as they're like squabbling with each other over the post-war arrangements, he sees an opportunity to leave and retake power in France. So he does. So in 1815, he escapes from Elba, goes back to France, is 
met by, you know, the remnants of the French army, who basically just declare him once again to be their leader. And for a hundred days, he is back in power. So, Louis XVIII was still there, but Napoleon now has returned as the great military hero of France. So, he gets ready to now, you know, hunker down and fight for his life. And there's one more decisive battle, at the Battle of Waterloo, which is in modern-day Belgium. This is Napoleon's final, final defeat, where once again he runs into a coalition force led by the Iron Duke, and Prussian forces as well, which finally, you know, bring him down once and for all. So, Napoleon loses his battle, he's captured, and this time the British are not taking any chances. They send him so far away he'll never be able to return, to the island of St. Helena, which is a navy base literally in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, so between South America and Africa. And on St. Helena, he is basically stuck there with, you know, a guard of a few hundred British soldiers and British ships that circle the island day and night until his death a few years later. Now, once Napoleon is gone, and actually this happened after his first defeat at the Battle of Leipzig, in 1814, a new conference is called together called the Congress of Vienna. And this is made up of delegates from the five great powers of Europe at the time, Austria, Prussia, Russia, the United Kingdom, and France, but France of the Bourbon dynasty, not Napoleon's France. So these are the five great powers, the Austrian Habsburg Empire, the Russian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, France under Louis XVIII of Bourbon, and the United Kingdom. And it's led and organized by a prince, the foreign minister of the Austrian Habsburg dynasty, Clemens von Metternich, pictured right here in the middle. And these are the, you know, representatives from the various other countries involved. And you can see the Tsar of Russia himself was there. This was a big deal. So at the Congress, over the course of a year, you know, and basically while this Congress is happening, Napoleon is defeated, he escapes, he's defeated again. So what initially was actually going to be kind of a lenient peace toward France, you start to see that the countries involved in this decision-making process are going to become more sort of vindictive and wary of France in 1815 because of Napoleon's, you know, adventurous activities. So at this Congress, a few big decisions are made. France has to pay reparations, so they have to pay money to the countries that they invaded, that, you know, had to go to war against them in order to pay off the debts that they incurred to defend themselves. The Bourbon dynasty is officially restored for good in France, although you're going to see within a few years there will be challenges to that again. And you start to see really for the first time a dedication to what's known as collective security among the great powers, where the great powers of Europe, they won't just agree to not go to war with each other, they're also going to agree to actually work together to put down problems where they may arise. This is really the first time that we see this happening in European society, in European international relations. So the system they create is called the Concert of Europe, the Peace of Europe, or the Congress System. Now, under the Concert of Europe and the Congress System, there's agreements among the five great powers to not go to war against each other, avoid warfare among the great powers, and maintain a balance of power. So basically built into this agreement is the idea that if one of the great powers decides to try and expand or take over another country, the other countries are going to ally with each other to block that. So this is a kind of guarantee that if, you know, one of us gets a little too ambitious, the others are going to be there to check the power of that one. So the balance of power will be maintained. And this is something that, you know, had been the goal of, you know, the, to some extent, the Treaty of Westphalia way back in 1648. And all of the wars of the 1700s were kind of over this issue of, you know, the balance of power and countries trying to block their rivals from becoming too powerful. But now this is really kind of set in stone in this agreement. Like, we need to have a situation where the great powers kind of agree to maintain the status quo. That's what really this Congress system is all about. Keep the status quo and protect 
legitimate governments. So governments that are in power when the French Revolution began, those are the governments that need to stay in power um, once this agreement is made. And they agree to suppress radical revolutionary ideologies. So even though obviously England and France, after the revolution, you know, these are countries that are more liberal than places like Austria or Prussia or Russia. But basically their attitude is keep violent revolutions from happening, stop them from happening. And you will see that some countries will actually intervene in other countries to stop revolutions after this agreement is made. Now, they also restore the borders to 1792, before France began expanding outward to take over land from neighboring countries. And they create new buffer kingdoms around France to make it more difficult for them to ever sort of emerge again. Now, the Confederation of the Rhine that Napoleon created, they actually keep this in place, but now it's going to be called the German Confederation, and there will be a parliament made up of the German states, so the Holy Roman Empire is gone for good, never coming back. So, here is the map of Europe, 1815. Austrian Empire, Kingdom of Prussia, the German Confederation, including Prussia and Austria, the Russian Empire, France, but reduced to its 1792 borders, Great Britain. The Netherlands has been expanded, so, the Bel so Belgium and the Netherlands actually are going to be combined into one single kingdom under a Dutch king. And then Italy, you're going to see a new kingdom created, the kingdom of Piedmont Sardinia, which will also be kind of a buffer. So now if France ever wants to try and joop or joop, they have to go through these bigger, more powerful kingdoms again. So that is it for Napoleon's rise and fall. So now test your knowledge with these questions, and I'll see you in class. Bye.